Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I, as uh, has just been mentioned, I work at UCL, and I'm an atmospheric chemist. I'm not such a brave atmospheric chemist as our speaker tonight, in that all of my atmospheric chemistry takes place in a laboratory, and uh, I don't ever go into the field, um, un unlike uh, tonight's speaker, uh, whom we're going to see and learn from his observations. <coughs> The atmosphere is, of course, uh, essential for life on Earth, humans, all ecosystems. And so, therefore, if we change the atmosphere, uh, we change this harmony between us and the air. Of course, most of the atmosphere is boring. Um, it's stable. It's nitrogen, oxygen, and 1% argon. I'm actually contractually obliged to mention the 1% argon because argon was discovered at UCL in 1906. <laughs> So that's got that out of the way. Um, uh, but the rest, therefore, is trace gases, a tiny fraction of the air. Uh, of course, trace gases in the atmosphere are trace gases because they're, they're, they're the ones that participate in the chemistry and the physics, and therefore they're used up, and that's why they're trace. But they, they have such a, a, an inordinate effect on atmospheric and environmental change. And so the challenge really is to, to measure the concentrations of these trace gases um, and understand what these trace gases do in the atmosphere. And that's something that tonight's speaker has, has devoted his career to doing. So that's why we've got people like uh, Professor Lewis, who we all refer to as Ali, by the way. Um, <laughs> his, his work on developing detection techniques using grass, gas chromatography um, Going forward to miniaturized detectors, which I don't know if you're going to mention, Ali. Um, he's not going to mention them, um, but he's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the next talk he's, he's going to give. Um, but he's absolutely he's, he's groundbreaking. He's developed new techniques. He's devised new techniques and new ways of analyzing um, atmospheric measurements, which tell us so much more about the environment we live in. Um, and... He, <coughs> His insight is absolutely immense. His papers are an absolute joy to read, um, but they're hard to find because he's got such a, a common surname. Um, but uh, I'll leave the floor to you right now, Ali, and uh, thank you. And he's going to tell us about air pollution, past, present, and future. Please welcome Ali Lewis. <laughs> Well, uh, good evening, everybody, um, and thank you, Dave, for that introduction. I hope I can live up to the billing. Um, what I'd like to do uh, this evening is to give a bit of background to air pollution, which has a very long history. Um, several thousand years it's been around as an issue. Now, I've only worked in the subject for about 25 years, and even over that time, it's a topic which essentially oscillates up and down in terms of the public consciousness. Uh, and we've certainly went through a period in the... Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s when air pollution was a very big issue uh, and it was behind changes to legislation and taxing on fuel and so on. Um, then we went through a period, perhaps a decade or more, where air pollution rather reduced as a, as a topic and but it was displaced by climate change as perhaps being the number one atmospheric problem that we were working on. And then, of course, in the last three or four years, it's really grown again in, in terms of its significance. And a lot of that's down to uh, the increased evidence now that links air pollution to, to health. And in fact, I sat on the tube just coming across here on the Evening Standard, and there's another article on the number of people who've died in the capital this year uh, due to air pollution. So if you like, at the moment, we're on one of the up curves um, for air pollution in terms of its, uh, its profile. But I'm going to go right back to the start. And the very first recorded incidences of air pollution, or if you like, the fathers of the discussion of air pollution as a topic, uh, are these two gentlemen, both very famous in antiquity. Um, Hippocrates is essentially the first person to really document air pollution. Uh, he documents it more or less in, a, in an occupational health context, which is that if you're doing something as your job of work, and it's, em it's emitting lots and lots of pollution around you, um, it's emitting lots of smoke or lead or whatever, uh, it was going to limit your life. And so he makes the first recorded measurements, if you like, anecdotal measurements, that what's coming off combustion in particular doesn't seem to be particularly good for your health. And people in professions that were exposed to pollution seem to die uh, a lot sooner. And then you go fast forward to people like Pliny, and Pliny the Elder was also rather interested in air pollution. Um, 
not because he was particularly bothered about people, but Pliny was very concerned about the effects of air pollution on wine and beer. Um, and he was very concerned that air pollution from the growing sort of empire at the time uh, was degrading the quality of wine and what was the government of the day going to do about it. So these are the two sort of earliest examples that you can find in the literature that really make some explicit mention of man's activities releasing things into the air and there being deleterious effects from that. So this is, you know, 2,000 odd years ago we have these recorded incidents and if you like air pollution is created as a topic for discussion. We then go into a period where air pollution stops being discussed in terms of um, uh, its effects on health and we move into a period where it's all about odour and malodour. So people stop talking about pollution going into air and its effects on your health and whether it's making you die young or whether it's making you feel unwell and they really focus on this thing up here which is how does things smell and this goes on essentially through literature for about 500 years, um, ending up in about 1858 with this discussion that these are cartoons from Punch of the Great Stink, uh, which is, which is odour coming from the Thames. So there's a long period of recorded literature where emissions to air are really only described in the context of whether they smell nice or they smell bad. And overwhelmingly the literature is all about how bad they, uh, how bad they smell. Uh, and that gets us into the sort of the 1800s. So there's a sort of gap in time where malodour uh, is the topic of the day. But the sort of the more interesting link, of course, here is between pollution and how it affects people rather than their senses. And a really key figure in the development of um, air pollution as a, if you like, a medical topic is this chap called Percival Pott. Uh, now, he was doing his work in the sort of mid-1700s. And his, one of his areas was looking at cancers, and he's sort of one of the forefathers of research into cancers. And one of the many things that, that Percival Potts studied was, well, it's recorded in some of these reprints here. It's essentially looking at the frequency of various different cancers. One of the things that he begins to observe in the sort of mid-1700s is the high frequency of testicular cancer in chimney sweeps. And he writes on this subject, and that says there must be something about chimney sweeps uh, and their activities that links it to uh, this particular incidence of cancer. So if you like, this is the first epidemiological connection that's made between air pollution emissions and, uh, and direct health impacts, rather than sort of malodors and bad smells, actually find a connection between this and your health. Uh, now, of course, if you like, the sophistication of the medicine at the time meant that in order to find the effect of the pollution, you had to be really unbelievably exposed. And of course, the effect that he's detecting here um, was the effect of polycyclic aromatic compounds carried on black carbon, um, obviously in huge concentrations up the walls of chimneys. Uh, it was that exposure to polycyclic aromatic compounds uh, in the soot, which then led to the high incidences of cancer in people that were exposed to it. So obviously, it had to have a huge dose in order to see the effect. Uh, but it was a very it was a correct connection, if you like. And of course, if you take if you fast forward 300 years to modern day legislation, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons carried on black carbon are legislated for by EU directives, and there's a limit value outside, and so on. So there's a real direct line that you can draw between the work done 300 years ago by Pot through to some of the legislation, effectively that we've got today. Uh, so he's one of the sort of the first chaps to really begin to nail down some health effects. Um, of air pollution, again, particularly focusing on the impacts of uh, the impacts of combustion uh, and black carbon. And of course, black carbon is always one of the first things to be sort of identified in air pollution because you can see it. So most of the science in sort of older literature associated with air pollution tends to revolve around black carbon because it's the one thing you can see rather than the gases that you can't see. Okay, so then to get a real feel for how pollution is developing. We don't have any measurements at all. So, that, so air pollution is, is hamstrung compared to, say, climate science. In climate science, if you want to know what's gone on with CO2 over the last thousand years, you dig a hole in the snow and you draw out your air pollutant, uh, you draw out your CO2 from the snow and you make a measurement and that tells you something about the CO2 at the time. Most air pollutants are reactive, so you can't dig a hole in the snow and find them. You have to really make a rather indirect route to make some assessment of what the pollution levels were like. Nobody was measuring it. And in fact, there's a, a small sort of uh, group of people who are enthusiastic analyzers of uh, paintings. And it's around the time of Turner that people begin to put into paintings indications of pollution. So an awful lot of art uh, that predates this is 
Uh, of course, very idealistic. It, we show nice scenery and so on, pictures of apples and all the rest of it. And it's around the time of Turner that we begin to see, if you like, warts and all uh, pictures uh, of the urban environment. Uh, so this is, one of, this is a Turner from 1832. And this we begin to see is some more realistic depictions of the atmosphere at the time. Uh, and so we're beginning to see, yes, there was um, uh, emissions. Uh, the more important thing is not so much whether we can estimate um, uh, what the concentrations of these are, that's all but impossible, but it tells you something about where the sources were. And because what we begin to pick out is that the large emission sources were being located in urban centres. Uh, and this is one example. And again, if you keep moving forward through time, this is obviously a very famous one from Monet um, of London. And this is a good one because it really shows in the background here how London had become a highly industrialised location. Um, and again, we don't have any real observation of what concentrations of air pollution were at the time, but we can make some assessment of what they might be based on just the intensity of industry that's reflected in the paintings of the time. So it's over the, this period of perhaps 1750, 1800 through to um, around 1900, where really the only indication of what's going on is to try to pick apart essentially what's in the background scenery um, of artwork at the time. And that tells us something about uh, whether we think that there were high levels, for example, of particulate, what the visibility was like. And that's perhaps one of the most informative things from this sort of artwork, is it tells you something about visibility. And there is a direct connection between visibility and air pollution levels in most urban locations. Okay, so if you can check out the visibility on that picture there, you might be able to make some sort of estimate of what the particulate, particulate loading was. Okay, so we've, we've basically moved forward from 2000 um, BC, sort of antiquated reports of air pollution and its effects, through a period where some small connections are being made, if you like, between health impacts and air pollution, some indications in artwork that pollution is beginning to encroach on city centres, particularly in terms of uh, the big urban centres like Birmingham and, uh, and London, but we're still not particularly quantitative in terms of what those emissions are. Things aren't being broken down into individual species, individual chemicals, uh, in the way that we would do that now. So what I've got is a next, sort of, if you like, a next staging post here, which is occurring around the same time as Monet's work here, are some of the first analyses, if you like, of air pollution done quantitatively. By that, I mean measuring the amount of material, identifying what the chemistry of that material is, and then making some assessment of, uh, of its impacts. Now, in fact, this is, this is for carbon dioxide, uh, so it's not, if you like, an air pollutant in the sense that we would think about it in terms of short-term effects, but it's really one of the first examples where someone has actually identified, here is an emission coming from a man-made process, it's releasing a particular chemical, and it's having an effect as a pollutant. Uh, and so for those who often sort of somehow think that climate was invented in the 1970s as a means for people to get funding, um, you know, of course, the, it actually traces back to uh, work by Savant Arrhenius, a fairly respectable physical chemist, um, who made some observations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, made observations of the concentrations of those species, and then made some estimates of uh, what the warming of that CO2 would be. Now, the point with this is, of course, is that dug, hidden away in these papers, of course, is really the first connection between the fact that this is being released from man-made processes. Uh, and if you like, CO2 is the first pollutant to really be properly quantified uh, at a molecular level. Uh, and it's perhaps not surprising. You know, it's one of the most abundant. It's far more abundant than most of the other pollutants. Okay, but we start off more or less with Arrhenius you know, around the turn of the century and people like him already identifying carbon dioxide as a pollutant, tying it back to man-made activities. And in this particular case, not saying it's going to harm your health, but saying it is almost certainly going to have an effect on the radiative balance of the atmosphere. And I believe in this that, that um, Arrhenius gets within 25% of the modern-day estimate of the warming of CO2. So he did a pretty good job you know, 120 years ago. OK, so in terms of the chronology of all this, you have to move forward to around 1920 to 1930 to have some of the first, if you like, direct measurements of air pollutants that we're more or bothered with today in terms of urban health. So again, if you turn to the artwork of the time, OK, so we'll fast forward to the artwork of the time. So this is Lowry, 1926. Again, very useful because it gives indications of visibility. Okay, so, oops. It gives indications of visibility. Uh, it gives indications of the density of emissions, 
Uh, it gives indications of the height of emissions. All of these things are little bits of evidence, if you like, that you can use to try to reconstruct what you think the atmosphere was like. And of course, it shows, as we know from this, it's, these are all based in urban centres with large populations. So it's around this sort of time, okay, so we're still seeing air pollution depicted well within the centre of urban environments, uh, that we begin to obtain the analytical ability to actually begin to break these chemicals down one by one into some of the classical air pollutants, meaning nitrogen dioxide, sulphur dioxide, and ozone. So some of the basic analytical chemistry has now got to be sufficiently advanced that the air pollutants that we would measure today, that will be measured out on some DEFRA monitoring site outside here, are being measured for the first time. So this is when real concentrations, if you like, enter the literature. Um, they're generally done by titration, so you might get one measurement, perhaps in a week or something. It will be highly imprecise, but it does give a ballpark figure for what the exposure was like at the time. And at the point at which people could measure uh, these pollutants, uh, if you like, air pollutant as a, as a press interest story begins to develop. Um, so this is taken from 1930, and it just shows that complaints about where you cite power generation are not a new invention. Uh, this was a paper that was written, and you can read it from the top, the controversy which is written in the daily press over the creation of a new power station at Battersea for the moment, once again, focused attention of Londoners on the air they breathe. So this is from 1930. Um, and at this point, William Reynolds could make measurements of certain species. So this one here was his conclusions for nitrogen dioxide. So he could measure nitrogen dioxide and had concluded that the amount measured both at both stations was higher when the wind blew from the west or southwest than when it blew from the east. What he means is if you're downwind of Battersea Power Station, you're going to experience more nitrogen dioxide than if you're upwind of Battersea Power Station. So at this point, a number of these species are being measured and they're already being tied to individual sources. And if you like, Londoners are already saying, we don't want that next to our house, please, because it doesn't look very good. Um, but it's also illuminating because whilst there are species that could be measured at the time, some of the species as pollutants still eluded understanding. So at the time, ozone, so the sort of the key photochemical smog component of urban pollution, could be measured. So people knew it was there, but they couldn't understand its behaviour. So in this particular case, if you sort of scan through the text here, um, but variations in the amount of ozone in the air are due to factors that we can only guess at and do not understand. And of course, this is because whilst NO2 and sulphur dioxide, for example, were primary emissions coming straight out of the stack, of course, ozone is a secondary pollutant formed by rather complicated chemistry downwind from the emission. So it highlights, if you like, the snapshot of the understanding of the science at the time, which is that we knew where the direct emissions were. They were already beginning to focus attention, but there were certain parts of that pollution mix uh, that really uh, w were still unclear. And because we've got to go forward, if you like, to Los Angeles before we solve the problem of, of how ozone gets formed. OK, so London at the time, of course, is undergoing continued expansion, continued industrialization. Um, and of course, it ends up, if you like, the sort of the high point of all this is these London smogs in the 50s, uh, the late 40s and 50s. And this is, if you like, sort of the, the end point of development uh, in terms of the evolution of pollution uh, in the UK. And of course, this leads to completely debilitating, as everybody knows, completely de debilitating loss of visibility uh, to the point at which it's essentially the economy stops functioning um, and something has to happen. Now, if I said before with Potts, uh, Percival Potts, he had to have a really extreme event or a really extreme exposure of air pollution to chimney sweeps to begin to be able to see a signal using, if you like, the science of the time. So you had to be exposed to loads and loads of chimney um, dust to, for him to be able to see the effect. And if you like, the London smogs were the first time that the health effects on the general population of air pollution, the signal was sufficiently large for people to detect it. Okay, so there are more sophisticated methods now, but it took events that were as significant and large as this for the health impacts on individuals to be changed significantly, um, so significantly enough that you could then begin to measure this. And this was what was detected after some of these great, uh, these great London smog. And of course, the generation of this is because of this great explosion in, if you like, quality of life. Quality of life in this particular instance, I mean, my meaning homes that were heated heated with coal, 
Uh, but nonetheless, this is moving to an environment where everybody has a home, um, and everybody has a home that they want to have heated, and fuel is abundant, relatively cheap and plentiful, uh, and so in, if, as part of the standard of, deliving, standard of living development, um, we end up with these hazes, and this is very, very large diffuse emission of sulphur dioxide from coal, coupled with the fact that we're living amongst all these industrial works and power stations as well. So the point is, and I'll return to this a little bit later, is if you like, this is a, a natural consequence of the development cycle that we begin to see play out in some of the later examples um, of air pollution that we go through. So I'll take London, if you like, as the base case, which is that you start off and you go through your development cycle and your overwhelming um, urge is to access cheap fuel, essentially. You're after cheap fuel, um, you're after cheap manufacture, you're after cheap transport. Uh, and you burn that fuel and you create that energy source um, at the exclusion of all other considerations. And this is essentially what's going on in London in the 50s. But as I said, the signal on people was sufficiently great that it actually induced, obviously, <laughs> some significant public outrage. Now, this is, of course, what you had to do, I guess, in, the, in those days. If you wanted to publish a paper with a figure, you had to draw it by hand. Um, <laughs> and probably, I don't know, then photocopy it or whatever, but you have to, you've got to produce your figure. And this is from the original publication that reported this. And of course, the point is, is that the signal is now big enough. So we've got some daily measurements of smoke, which is a rather indeterminate pollutant. It's largely black carbon. Uh, a measurement of sulphur dioxide. And then we've got a measurement of deaths, as measured by the total number of deaths recorded at uh, London hospitals. Now, it turns out that this figure is actually a gross underestimate. Uh, but it's the first one that appears. I mean, I think, in fact, modern-day estimates multiply that access by a factor of 20 to get to the real figure. But at the time, if you like, the noise on the signal of the number of deaths and the amount of SO2 in the atmosphere was pretty big. And you needed these really extreme events to actually suddenly make people think, hang on a minute, this is looking like there's a cause and effect here between deaths, SO2 and smoke. So, of course, this then triggers an enormous amount of discussion and actually relatively swift action in terms of legislation. Um, and, of course, this gets into a lot of, um, a lot of uh, press reports, and it's a relatively quick step from those London smogs, the very, very bad press that it, um, uh, that it develops, through to the introduction of the Clean Air Act in 1956. In terms of time scale for legislation, um, this is really pretty fast, uh, because you have to think that the Clean Air Act introduces quite significant cost uh, onto the UK economy, uh, and it's introduced reasonably quickly. Uh, although at the time there are quite a large number of members of Parliament who make the argument that smog is good for you uh, and helps clear the lungs, and it's absolutely fascinating. You, know, you mustn't become, I won't become sort of politically um, uh, inclined here, but you might guess which political persuasion believed that smog was good for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in fact, there are, there are some amazing reports from the time where, where people very argue that, in fact, the sulphur helps you breathe more easily. Anyway, the, the Clean Air Act is passed in 1956, uh, and it really has a dramatic effect. Um, and if you like, the Clean Air Act is the sort of the world's primary example of effective air pollution legislation. Nowhere else in the world had ever introduced anything like the Clean Air Act, and it's essentially used as the model for um, the effectiveness of policy interventions. Okay, so data is pretty sketchy. Unfortunately, as is still the case today, people tend to not monitor before policy and after policy. They tend to do the policy and then measure afterwards uh, without ever knowing whether it had an effect. Um, this is essentially a compilation of all the sulfur dioxide measurements that are around uh, from the Midlands at the time. So remember, the Clean Air Act is a UK-wide piece of legislation. So the data is very sketchy. So you can see around the time of the Clean Air Act, really nobody was measuring these things, which is a shame. But then you can see after the Clean Air Act, people begin to get their act in gear, and we start to have a larger number of observations of, um, this is sulphur dioxide in micrograms per cubic metre. And then you can see over this intervening period that there's a very, very steep decline in sulphur dioxide over then the intervening 40 years. It, the effectiveness of the legislation really bites pretty quickly. Right the way down to the mid-2000s, where essentially... Um, government monitoring of SO2 stops. They turn the monitors off because they say we can't really detect it anymore. So there's almost no measurement of SO2 left because the pollutants disappeared. So that was a really effective intervention. If you like, it was the good example of how you could nail the source of the pollution. It was sulphur from coal combustion. You could introduce some direct legislation to deal with it. 
And over the next few years, essentially, the problem begins to, uh, to diminish. Because the 70s sees the emergence of a different problem. So nobody is burning in developed countries high sulfur coal in urban centres anymore. But that doesn't mean that everybody has nailed air pollution. So, of course, in the 1970s, we developed this phenomenon of photochemical smog. So it's a different form of pollution. It's not the, the thick, white, hazy stuff from London. It's this different brown layer. You can just about see it's a brown layer at the boundary layer top here, which is nitrogen dioxide, coupled with this really astringent, low-level ozone. And this is the point at which um, Crutzen uh, wins the Nobel Prize, effectively. He doesn't get it in the 70s, but he gets it later for discovering how this ozone is formed through, through secondary chemistry. And again, the reasons why it emerges in Los Angeles are essentially the same as London in the 1950s, which is that you're having very, very large economic expansion, big demographic growth, and a rush to use the cleanest energy that you can, the, the, sorry, the cheapest energy that you can, with little thought of the cost. In this particular case, the energy is being channeled into infrastructure and transport, whereas the energy, if you like, in London was being channeled into heating and, um, uh, and industry. But it's still the source of cheap energy, if you like, is the, is, is the factor that this arises. So Los Angeles has a different problem that it has to fix. And again, it takes a certain amount of time to work out what the precursors to ozone are and that where the nitrogen dioxide is coming from. Uh, but in this particular case, it turns out because we're dealing almost entirely with a traffic source. So it's a different case. So the lessons learned from the Clean Air Act, whilst you can show that legislation can be effective, now we've moved from homes and coal and power stations, now we've moved across to to road transport. So we need a new set of solutions for this. Remember, we've now solved the problem uh, from 1930 of not understanding where the ozone comes from. We've now cracked that one by the 70s. Oops. And again, in the US and internationally, there are introductions of something called the Gothenburg Protocol. And these also really hit hard on nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide, which are the precursors to, to photochemical smog. Nitrogen dioxide is directly bad for you. Car carbon monoxide is bad for you at really high concentrations, but it also contributes to ozone. And it's the catalytic converter that nails this particular problem. And you can see again here in the US, these are often used as their example. These are US data of, again, showing how effective that legislation was. Their limit value for NO2 is here. And you can see there's a lot of spread depending on where you are in the US, but the number has come consistently down um, to where we are today. So again, it's not an overnight impact, but in terms of a sort of policy success, there's been a considerable improvement here, particularly for carbon monoxide, which is easy to remove from, from um, catalytic converters. But we also see through the 80s and 90s, this group of acronyms here, which is the CLRT, stands for the Convention on the Long Range Transport of Air Pollution. So this is the first time at which, rather than dealing with air pollution at a local level, so the Clean Air Act dealt with London, California Air Resources Board brought in legislation for California, which then spread to the whole of the US. We suddenly realised that, in fact, most of these pollutants are quite capable of being moved from one country to another, particularly around Europe, of course, where the borders effectively all sit in close proximity to one another. And so this is the point in the 1980s where we effectively we internationalise the problem of air pollution. We stop it being just the problem of one country. We now say, actually, you can't end up sending your pollution from the UK across to um, across to France or to the Netherlands or whatever, and they can't keep moving their pollution to the east either. So we begin to introduce some international conventions which limit things. And of course, this makes things more difficult, because once you introduce the international dimension, you slow down the rate at which you can effectively introduce policy. You only move at the speed of effectively the slowest player. So we get to the end of the 20th century. So effectively, this is my first sort of potted history of the past almost bringing us up to the present. And this is a welcome trust analysis that I think is an amazing, which basically says, what did everybody die of in the 20th century? So it's a very cheerful slide. Um, and they, they've broken down into these sort of four big categories, non-communicable diseases, humanity, which I'll blow up in a minute, um, infectious diseases, and cancer. So everybody dies of something, and everybody dies of something in one of these bubbles. Okay? And if you blow up humanity, so this is to give you a scale, okay? So over the 20th century, air pollution is here. So 116 million people are estimated to have died um, uh, from air pollution. So it puts it on roughly the same sort of scale in terms of impact of deaths as drugs and war. Okay? So that gives you the sort of same size. Interestingly, it also puts it on the same scale as ideology, which if you break ideology down, you get communism, uh, fascism, and so on. Um, but you, give, you get a scale here. Okay? 
which is that over the 20th century, we've sort of had uh, something here which has had equivalent numbers of deaths to some of these other um, human-induced effects, but also similar sorts of impacts, for example, as lung cancer um, or a number of other cancers as well, or cardiovascular um, diseases. So it's had a really huge effect on air pollution o over the 20th century and, and, in fact, before. So the question is, where do we go from now? So I've showed lots of graphs that go down. Okay? So the, if you like, the, sort of the simplistic answer is, well, if all these graphs are going down, the bubble here over the 21st century is going to be smaller. Okay? And I'm going to explore whether that's going to be the case or not in the next few slides. Okay? So where we are now, okay, we're 15 years into the next century, but we'll sort of take it that the century's only just started. And this is what the current predictions say will be the top five causes of preventable deaths in 2030. So it's slightly di different if you're in the UK compared to the rest of the world. So if you're in the UK, even in 2030, smoking is still the number one cause of preventable death okay, that you can do something about. Interesting in the UK, air pollution will be the number two cause of preventable death. Uh, obesity will be number three, physical activity will be number four, and alcohol will be number five. Okay? And of course the point of this is you can do something about one, three, four, and five, but you can't do a great deal about two. Okay? So of the causes of preventable death in the UK in 2030, according to the WHO, four of them are within your control and one of them is outside of your control. The same five horsemen of the apocalypse, if you like, uh, apply if you take the globe as a whole, except it inverts slightly the order, which then makes air pollution becomes the largest cause of death in 2030 globally, with smoking second, obesity third, malnutrition fourth, and physical activity fit. So alcohol drops off the list here, and we bring malnutrition in. So you can see, in terms of a global scale, whilst we've had some pretty big impacts over the 20th century, if anything, air pollution is now moving up the league table rather than down the league table. And of course, this is to do now with us exposing ever larger populations to high air pollution. So if you rewind back to 1950, the numbers of people globally that were exposed to high air pollution was pretty limited. You're talking about the major European cities, major US cities, and that's probably more or less it. Of course, you fast forward to where we are now, and this is a globe, an overview of where these hotspots are. Um, those places where people are exposed to air pollution is massively expanding. So whilst we have some encouraging downward trends in locations like Europe and the US, uh, we have trends going in opposite directions in other places. So this is a measurement of nitrogen dioxide measured from space. So it's a little bit of a difficult thing to understand because it doesn't really tell you what's going on at the surface. It's the total amount of nitrogen dioxide in the column over your head. But it sort of illustrates to you where, uh, where the action is. So we still clearly have very high air pollution as measured as NO2 over Europe, partly reflecting the fact we have a high diesel fleet here. There is high NO2 remaining over the US, and you can also see large conurbations like Mexico City and Sao Paulo, and Buenos Aires now beginning to pop out, visible from space. Johannesburg has a very, very high level of NO2. They essentially generate all of Africa's electricity there by coal combustion. And of course, over here, you can't miss the amount of nitrogen dioxide from China and also the growing amount up here in India and also in the Middle East as well. So this spread of pollution in terms of its exposure, people's exposure to it, is now spreading to larger and larger populations. So we do have history repeating. So this is a picture I took from a hotel room when I went to Beijing a few uh, months ago, and this is one I took <laughs> when I was in, went to Lagos on a trip. And what you can see here is, is you know, we are just repeating, if you like, um, what's happened before. And in both cases, it's exactly the same reasons. It's equivalent, if you like, to the demographic transition. That as you go into this development phase, you rush for the cheapest forms of energy that you can, you use them without any thought for their impacts because growth is the overwhelming priority. Okay? It's growth above all other things. Often for good reasons, to increase living standards and public health and so on, but it's growth at any cost. And growth at any cost, in all these examples, tends to lead to extremely high pollution levels because the cheapest energy source typically is the most polluting. So very, very high uh, coal combustion here, lots of traffic, and again, lots of traffic and energy production in Africa as well. So we do have history repeating. And the key here, if you like, if economic development brings with it air pollution and air pollution transition, a little bit like the demographic transition of trying to have populations stabilise in developing countries as quickly as you can. Essentially what we need to do is to move through the air pollution transition as quickly as we can. 
there are almost no examples of any countries that have managed to go through the, a fast a development cycle and not have severe air pollution, at least as a transitory consequence of that development. There are two examples that are often touted. One is Singapore, which managed to do it without having air pollution, uh, and the other one is South Korea. And both are cases where they also went through the demographic transition extremely quickly as well. Okay? So we are locked in, if you like, to a certain amount of history repeating. And of course, the reason, again, I've mentioned about the power generation, but we've also got to factor in, if you like, into modern transitions, that it's not just about the rush for cheap energy for industry and cheap energy for electricity. What we now get is also a rush for transportation, transport freedom, which brings with it cars. And if you like, the third part of the mix, which perhaps wasn't there in the 1950s and the 1970s, is the contribution that agriculture makes to air pollution. So this one's a little bit difficult sometimes to visualise, these are the easy ones that you can see, and everyone knows that cars are polluting. The amount of fertiliser that has to be used to feed the world's population results in enormous quantities of ammonia entering the atmosphere. And ammonia is a key precursor to forming particles. So a very, very substantial fraction of the particles that you breathe in will have the ammonium nitrate in them will have come from agricultural emissions. And this is something on a steeply upward curb as we try to produce more food for more people. So there are three pressure points now pushing on global air pollution. We have the classical one on energy sources, cheap energy for industry. We have superimposed on this uh, an equivalent parallel demand for transport systems, which weren't there in the 50s. Uh, and now we have this extremely high demand on agriculture, which leads to very high ammonia uh, emissions as well. And the real baddie in all of this, I haven't got a photo of, is it, if you take something like palm oil, palm oil has perhaps 10 times as much fertiliser per acre put on it as traditional agriculture uh, does. So some of the crops that we've been growing for biofuels, for example, and as feedstocks, have, bring with them enormous consequences for air pollution. OK, so this is where we are. And of course, not all is lost. So if you take China as an example of somewhere that's trying to tackle uh, this problem. They have the advantage, of course, of a top-down control structure. If you say stop driving, people stop driving. Uh, and they have some control over their pollution. And they are moving, so this is Beijing, through this transition relatively quickly. So there is a phase-out in China of uh, coal-fired power stations. There's much more control. So they transition through this period, and they still have terrible, terrible air pollution. The difference here is from the hotel room that I was in, between one day and three days later, the haze has built up to this. So it's not a solved problem, but they've effectively passed through peak pollution and are now on the downward curve. And it will probably take them another 30 years to get to levels that are reasonably acceptable. But if you like, they've gone over the peak and back down again, and I reckon that peak period will last for perhaps 30 or 40 years. Contrast that with London, where the estimate is that the transition period of having really crappy air to having sort of moderately acceptable was about 150 years. So it took London a lot longer to solve the problem, if you like, than it will take Beijing. But the consequences will be very, very significant because if you're living there at the time. Right. Now we get on to the size of the bubbles and the thing that's lurking in the background here in terms of impact. All of the time we've got graphs going down. This is good. Even in Beijing, the graphs are going down in terms of levels of air pollution. The problem is there's another graph that's there. And that graph is life expectancy. Okay? So this is from the UK. And what we've got here is a graph of life expectancy, mode median uh, life expectancy uh, for a female in the UK over the last 150 years. And what you can see, of course, is that as this graph uh, goes forward in time, life expectancy keeps on going up. Okay? So the impacts of air pollution are highly tied to susceptible populations. Okay? The most susceptible populations are those that have weaknesses in their respiratory systems, their cardiovascular systems. Now, that tends to mean children, and it tends to mean the elderly. So that tends to be the two key demographics that are most at risk. And, of course, the point here is the more the graph goes up, the more you increase the population of people that are susceptible to uh, air pollution effects. So if you like, very crudely, in 1950, not that many people were living to be that old. So there were plenty of other things to die of other than air pollution. But because as we move forward with improved health care, we, we have an increasingly ageing population that are particularly sensitive to this. So whilst we might be on trends that are downward in terms of the absolute concentrations that are in air, they are slowly improving in places like uh, Europe. The problem is if the people that we're exposing that air pollution to are becoming more susceptible. Okay? So if you like, the bubble it has a lot of stresses on it. 
We've got stress of the size of global population being exposed is growing. So we're now exposing billions of people where before it was only hundreds of millions. And now we've got a population that are becoming more and more susceptible, if only because of their age. And so here are just some plots just showing some of the really, really crude things that show how modern pollution seems to be bad for our health. Uh, so this is calcification of the arteries. And it's a really clever, neat study. All it does is it simply asks you, when you go in to have this study done, how far is your house from the main road? Okay? How far do you live from the main road? So it doesn't matter whether you live in a mansion or you live in a, um, you know, a little box house. How far do you live from the main route? And what you can see in this really simple study is that your risk score up here increases just depending on how far you are from the road. So a really expensive house doesn't help you out if you're on a main transport route. And some of these increases in terms of risk are really high. 50% increases in risk for coronary artery calcification just because of your proximity to a, a road route. So here's another one. This is another effect. Subclinical atherosclerosis, um, which again is to do with the cardiovascular system. And what you can see here is a change, effectively, in your uh, ability, uh, your, the, the wall thickness that you've got in your artery walls, versus the amount of particulate matter. Okay? Now, to calibrate yourself, this is a study that was done over a relatively narrow range, 14 to 22 micrograms per cubic metre. Now, the World Health Organization guideline is... Oops, move on to this pointer, is here. Okay. The EU directive value, which is what we're all trying to achieve in the UK, is here. So we're already out here. And the amount that you get if you were in Beijing is sort of over here somewhere, perhaps 150 micrograms per cubic metre. So even at sort of current well-developed European levels, we are well above the point at which significant changes are observed. And just one final one, which I think this is an interesting one. So this is, again, looking at your estimated daily inhaled dose of PM2.5. So that's a particular size fraction of particulates. And what this does, because this just puts, it, puts lots of studies onto one scale. And what this does very nicely is it shows that, effectively, these studies up here are smokers who get their dose of particulates from smoking. These people down here are just people walking about in cities. And this really just shows effectively that air pollution in terms of particulars is just part of the same continuum, if you like, as smoking. There's a gap, it's a log scale, but that's the sort of dose of particulates that you'd have given yourself and the effects that you'd have had if you'd smoked, and that's the air pollution ambient levels, and they're all on the same line. So clearly the risk is higher if you smoke, but it's only the same sort of linear adjusted risk that you'd have from air pollution. So, and I, I, you could show, I could show hundreds of these. So, if you like, we've got all these effects that happen at relatively low concentrations down here. We've got populations that are increasingly exposed to these. Uh, and whilst I focus perhaps on the, on the demographic one of having an, an ageing population, the other part of this is that the other susceptible group, which is children, uh, the damage that's done to your lungs in development effectively stays with you all of your life. So if you reduce lung function through exposure to high air pollution when you're growing up, you carry that lung function for the rest of your life. So if it's degraded by 10% because of exposure to pollution, you will have that 10% with you forever. OK. Now, a big question, as I'm getting towards the end here, which is if we just take the UK, and I'm going to just show a few current research slides here, and a big thing that's, that's raised a lot of attention is essentially in the UK, why isn't our air quality improving anymore? And... What we have here is some actual London air quality measurements. These are by King's College London. And what you can see here is since 1992 and 2010, not a lot really happens for nitrogen dioxide in London. It more or less stays the same. But the estimated emissions of NOx keep, we're supposed to be going down. And this has caused a lot of um, head scratching. Uh, why is it that apparently our emissions should be going down, but our ambient measurements are staying the same? And at the heart of this, is the need to actually monitor whether policies work or not. And I'm just including nitrogen dioxide here as a really sort of salutary tale in the need to assess policy. If you're going to do things to improve air pollution, make sure you have a way of checking that they're working. Because these cost money. So if you've bought cars over the oops, if you've bought cars over this period, okay, you'll know that if you bought a car in 1990, it won't have had a catalytic converter. Or it may not have had a catalytic converter. It wasn't mandatory at that point. If you've bought a car since then, over that period, you'll have bought cars with ever more sophisticated catalytic converters that were, in theory, supposed to reduce air pollution emissions over the, 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 the years. And you've paid for it as well. If you've ever had to replace a catalytic converter on a car, it costs a lot of money. Yeah? So this is a policy that costs 
individuals a lot because you buy a car and a fraction of the cost of the car is all the platinum in the catalyst. Okay? And so in theory what should have happened in Europe is that the first catalytic converters should have limited nitrogen dioxide emissions to 20 grams per kilogram of fuel and it should have got better. Okay? Every time a new standard was brought in and a better catalytic converter was introduced, in theory the pollution should have got better, uh, the emissions should have got better. But nobody was really checking. And this is really the tale of policy needs to be evaluated. And in fact, what's happened is some very sophisticated techniques have come in for monitoring the emissions now directly out of back of cars. And wouldn't you know it, it turns out that basically, although we've had in theory improvements in emissions from ever improving catalysts, actually what's happened is those cars were effectively emitting the same they always were. And what happened in this particular case was a failure of the policy because of a failure of regulation. In the same way as when you buy um, a car and you see in a magazine it says you'll get 50 miles per gallon and everyone goes yeah well I'll probably get 30. Essentially the same thing was going on here. The test cycles being used to test for air pollution were grossly um, distorting what real life driving cycles were like such that cars in the real world have been emitting about 20 times more than they're supposed to be emitting. Uh, now we've moved into something called Euro 6 so if you buy a car now it will have a Euro 6 catalyst on it. It's slightly better on average, but you can see at the moment the regulation doesn't meet anything like the aspiration. Uh, so this is a reason why effectively air pollution has come down and down and down, but in, U but in Europe and in the US and in other developed countries which have had these advanced catalysts and advanced emissions control, things don't seem to be improving anymore. So if you have a flat trend in air pollution coupled with your increasing population susceptibility because of age profile, you can expect, even in those developed countries, that the bubble of deaths is going to get larger. Uh, because if you like, our improvements in air quality aren't tracking the increase in susceptibility. Just finally, of course, well, why is this? How has this happened? As a taxpayer, I want to know why, if I've had to buy expensive catalytic converters, they haven't worked. And this is a problem with not designing legislation correctly. Legislation, if you go outside, um, not very far from here, you'll find on the Marleybone Road this rather poorly disguised shipping container, um, which because there's air pollution instrumentation in it. All legislation is fixed around measuring how much is actually in air. So what is the current concentration in air? And that's interesting and really valuable data, and there's one in the countryside somewhere, I've nowhere, I do where. But the problem is knowing what's in the air doesn't tell you how much is being emitted. The connection between the two is rather difficult to make. Okay? Because what's in the air also depends on how strong the wind speed is, how many cars are on the road at that particular time, and so on. What you really need to assess is what the actual emission is. And this has started to happen. So this is a very, very recent set of work uh, that's been published using the BT Tower in London. So rather than measuring the amount of pollution that's in air, what it's doing is it's measuring what's called the flux. And the flux essentially is saying every time an updraft goes up the BT Tower, I measure the up spike in pollution, and every time a clean bit of air goes down in an eddy at the top of the BT Tower, I get a clean bit of air. And you couple the two together mathematically, and what you discover is then the amount of emission that's coming from the surface. So rather than getting the actual concentration, you now get directly at how much is being emitted per square kilometre. So now you can begin to test, is it having an effect in real time? So for London here, we've got two plots here. We've got the measured amount of emissions uh, per kilometre per year. So London NOx emissions we measure are around 125 to 150 tonnes of NOx per kilometre per year, but the inventory only estimated there to be about half of that. Okay, so we've now got to get to away from, well, not just measuring the absolute concentrations, but the emissions as well, because the emissions are the thing that really tell us what's going on. And just finally, uh, Dave <laughs> alluded that I did some things in some strange places, this was some experiments we did on a light aircraft over London. Um, this is about the biggest research aircraft you're allowed to fly over London without causing panic. Uh, there are larger four-engine jets available, but flying those is not encouraged. Um, and this is flying an aircraft now repeatedly over uh, central London at the height of the top of the shard. Okay? So you fly this repeatedly over the top of the shard. Now, what we've got here is the emissions inventory. So this is the estimate of what London's air pollution emissions were. And up until recently, there was no way of checking whether this was right. Okay? How, you can't check that that's right 
Uh, it's just a bottom-up. People add up all the sources and they say, this is how much we think is there. And you can spot the features. So you can spot the M25 very easily. You can spot Heathrow a mile off. Yeah? You can spot central London and you can just about spot London City Airport as well. So the sources are all where you'd expect them to be, but it's the magnitudes. Are these numbers right? Because in the past, what's been happening is these numbers have been going down, but the reality is the absolutes haven't been changing. And so the way to evaluate this now is to fly a flux measurement. Here you can see the flight paths of the aircraft going backwards and forwards over central London, measuring extremely quickly. And every time the aircraft experiences an updraft, this is at sort of um, 10 per second frequency, you get a burst of nitrogen dioxide. Every time you get an eddy coming down, you get uh, some clean air and you deconvolute the two of them and what you can see is we're now seeing the direct emissions that are coming from the surface so we've now moved from being a, a concentration in air to being a so many tons per kilometer so we would argue here that the way forward is to not only measure what's in air but what's the rate at which you're emitting it because that allows you much quicker to establish whether a policy you've introduced has worked so for example here if you introduce an ultra low emissions zone will you really be able to detect that it's had an effect. It may be difficult to detect that it's had an effect in terms of the absolute concentrations, but it may be that you could detect that in terms of the tons of emissions, it really has had an effect. So we need to, if you like, uh, improve the quality with which we determine whether these interventions are working. Just my final slide, there is a massive role for chemistry um, in all of this. You know, the whole of air pollution science is essentially chemistry. Um, and sometimes the role is considered rather narrowly, um, but we have to do everything, if you like. The chemistry of what goes on needs to be known at the sort of mechanistic level. There are people in atmospheric chemistry who spend their whole lives worrying about, if you like, the traditional drawing of curly arrows, degrading different organic compounds. And it really matters, because if you change, for example, formulations of fuels and you emit them into the air, you need to know the impact of it. And you, won't, you can't calculate the impact unless you can do all of the discrete chemistry, okay? all of the individual reactions to work out whether it's going to have a positive or a negative effect. This is sometimes lost, okay? that somehow you can skip the detail and just go straight to the big picture. In reality, you can't. There is a huge need for detailed chemistry right down at the mechanistic level. Of course, right at the other end of the spectrum, I would say, if you like, it's chemistry that's actually going to fix the problem. In the end, we need sources of energy that don't release um, harmful air pollutants, we need technologies that are going to be uh, efficient and clean by the various metrics that, that, that we set ourselves. And almost all of those are going to be chemical-based. Um, chemical and I don't have a particular favourite, whether it's hydrogen or electric or whatever, uh, they all have at their heart, if you like, chemistry research. So I really, my work is, if, is, if you like, down here, um, but I think you know, sometimes it's easy to forget that the actual solution to all of this is also going to be chemistry at this end of the spectrum. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. What an absolute delight. Um, she's told us not only about her understanding of air pollution, the history, which is fascinating, and, um, but understanding of our realisation and, and, and what we do about that. And I, I think that that's really clear. I've got loads of questions, but I have to uh, demure to, to, to you guys. Mm. So um, I, if you're happy to mm, sure. um, ask questions, yeah. uh, we've mm. got a roaming mic. Yeah. So um, gentleman in the blue shirt. Thank you. It was a great talk. Two quick questions. The flex measurements were done on a twin-engine aircraft flying a particular route. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could fly it over the whole of London. I understand you'd have problems with the Heathrow approach, because I have a pilot's license. But, um, uh, but if you could do that and publish it, it would have a hell of an effect on property prices. And, uh, <laughs> and the second question is, um, if you're old and I'm 70, should I move to the country? <laughs> That's a, uh, so, that's a question, isn't it? So on the, on the first one, this is something we would like to expand upon. You, you can understand the sensitivities of wanting to bring aircraft over cities. That was the very first experiment that we did, and we, they, we had to stick to one track, um, backwards and forwards. A second experiment, the CAA opened up a second track at right angles to it. It's a slow process of building confidence that 
you're not... I mean, one of the problems even of going across London like that is you're under the flight path of London City. It, it's... Just about that. Uh, not, not in the vertical, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> it's a thousand pieces of that. Yeah. You're, you're flying at 600, you know. Uh, four miles, there'll, there'll be uh, 2,000 feet. So it'll be okay. Yeah. Well, so, so it's an... Ex they're just bullshitting you. <laughs> So that part's expanding, so I think it's about confidence building. Interesting, because in developing countries, the potential to do this, so we've done similar work around Lagos, is actually much easier. So in fact, for those locations, it may be easier to screen from the air than to put things on the ground. In the UK, we've got a huge ground infrastructure that costs a lot of money to run, um, because that's how we've allowed things to develop. Um, it may well be that, in fact, for other countries, you skip straight, if you like, to the high-tech version, and you do it from the air. Um, that way you're not running 100 stations. On your second question about should you move to the country, um, I think you have to make your own risk assessment <laughs> on that one. <laughs> we, we had another question just, just in front, yes, sir? Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, I'm puzzled because what you've been really talking about is localised um, pollution at a, at a moment in time, whereas if we go to the, the more global picture, like CO2, that is measured um, and, and it's, a, it's a daily measurement somewhere, and it's, it's universal, and I thought that was the more dangerous one, rather than just to localise. And anyhow, does it make any difference whether it's down Piccadilly or just off a bit? It, it, you know, it's going to, there's going to be an exponential uh, drop-off but there's still a nasty pollution in the air. So, I mean, it's, it's like comparing apples and oranges, really. I mean, CO2 is extremely long-lived, which makes it very well mixed. So more or less the same concentration is what turns up everywhere. Uh, one of the, with pollution, it tends to be much shorter-lived. So if you take something like nitrogen dioxide, it might last for half a day or something like that. And of course, it is extremely variable. Then uh, let, let's change. What's the definition of pollution compared to the other one? Okay, so here I'm, t I'm to talk about effects that are on humans as they would, if you like, um, individual effects that are directly from the ingestion of the chemical, if you like. Um, the effects that we all experience through CO2 are not going to be from the ingestion of CO2. It may well be from an enormous storm or a, s or a sea surge or whatever, but it won't be from the CO2 itself. Broadly, air pollution is things that you breathe in that directly affect you. Now, I've talked mainly about things that have immediate acute effects, so things like effects on the respiratory system and, um, and the cardiovascular system. So they're things that get you and affect you, you know, very, in the very short term. But, of course, the very first examples on cancers were the accumulative effects of air pollution. So there is this other class, if you like, where it's your lifetime exposure that then leads to cancer. So I, I talk rather less on those. Um, but there is this second branch, if you like, which is the 30 years exposure to benzene, say, which then changes your risk factor for developing particular cancers. So I think it's the ingestion of the material directly having an effect that would be my definition. So it's a timescale issue, effectively. Well, I think it's whether, the, does the chemical harm you directly or yeah. indirectly? And in, in the case of CO2 and methane, they're not going to harm you directly, but the indirect effects might be pretty profound. Yeah. Yeah. On the long scale. Yeah. Do, does anyone else have a, a question, sir? Thank you, very interesting. If you were advised the government, what pollution would you ask them to concentrate on and how would you deal with it? Well, at the moment, it depends where you are. So if you're, central London. If you're in central London, we clearly have to get to grips with NO2. So NO2 is the pollutant that's, that's the one that, 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 that creates the headlines. And it's the one that's, that's really hasn't behaved as people would have expected. And it's a consequence of, of, the, failure of um, uh, the, the failure of emissions control. So I think NO2 has to be the priority for London. And you know, without doubt, there will be technical solutions to this that can be implemented. There will be a lot of pain if you're a car manufacturer. It will add cost. Um, and clearly, Europe is heavily invested in the production of small diesel engines. But clearly, there will be a solution to this. And it's, I think, just the speed at which that can be implemented and the pressure that can be brought to bear to, to, to make it happen. And particulates, it would be the second choice, and that's more difficult because rather than being able to just go for one particular source and say, make that better, the particulates in London are from a whole range of different sources. And there you would need to make a lot of small incremental improvements in a lot of areas. And I think policy-wise, that's much more difficult to do.
Can I indulge myself and oh. ask you a quick question? NO2, what, what's worse about NO2? Is it the ingestion of NO2 for humans or is it the ozone that, that's caused... In London, it's the direct ingestion of NO2. Rather than ozone, yeah. uh, rather than photolysis and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Very indulgent. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, we have a question right here. You mentioned that Europe is invested in small diesel machines, but we've known that, in fact, diesel is causing more pollution than, say, ordinary non-diesel non fuel. Yeah. Um, so what's the way forward on that score? Well, we know it now, but we probably didn't know it two years ago, and we should have known it ten years ago. Um, I mean, in, in principle, diesel is, is, a, is a relatively fuel-efficient way of generating mechanical motion. The failure here is on the emissions control. Um, obviously, this won't go any further than this room and then the internet, but clearly what's happened is the manufacturers of these <laughs> have cheated. So no further. Uh, yeah, so no further than that. Uh, they, they've essentially cheated, in my mind. They've, they've said that they were going to meet particular emissions standards, and they've only done it by running test cycles that weren't representative of the real world. Um, so if you drive diesel cars, there are tales of if you put something on a dynamometer and only the front wheels start spinning, the car knows it's being tested and it moves to a particular sort of combustion regime. Or if it senses you accelerating at particular um, controlled gradients, it knows it's in a testing regime and it cuts the power output. So, uh, I mean, it, it is a solvable problem, but in my opinion, it shouldn't have taken us 15 years to get to the point of now knowing, as, as we do, where the problem lies. I think fix the emissions problem, and there's no problem in using diesel as a fuel. Um, oh, we have loads of questions. So mm. I don't know who is next. Um, gentleman there, um, in the aisle. Are you still happy with Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You talked about the economic uh, dimension in, in particular, um, how things and, and the sort of different rates of change between the UK and, and, and China and, and people using uh, cheapest fuel available. Um, when it comes to sort of cleaning up uh, air uh, to improve health, is that in fact the most cost effective way of improving health? Because if you're looking at economic aspects, you should really be turning this on its head. What is the most effective way to improve your life expectancy or your life? And it isn't always preventive. That's not to say we can't improve uh, emissions, but is it really the most effective way for society to spend its money? It's a very good point. And I think one of the issues is that it changes depending on your point in time and where you are in the economic cycle. So if you go back 30 years in the UK, probably dealing with air pollution wouldn't have been the most cost-effective way of improving public health. There may have been other ways where you'd got more bang for your pound. Um, However, we are moving to an environment, potentially, where as air pollution moves up the list of preventable deaths, that it becomes more and more economically sensible to deal with that particular problem. So uh, there are already reports now, effectively, on the demands on the healthcare system in, in high air pollution episodes, effectively pushing it over 100% capacity. So we are moving into a time regime now where it is likely that, that it will meet that economic criteria that the most effective way that you can spend your pound in terms of public health is in dealing with air pollution. But it won't have been like that always. Um, and it may not be like that in some other countries. At the moment, they may be at different points in the cycle. I think it's particularly about other countries, because there has been pressure, certainly from Western countries, the United States in particular, for countries to decrease uh, air pollution when really I don't think it's the most appropriate thing to do. So, uh, and, and it will change. I agree with you. And actually, to the point raised here, should a person move to the country should be aware that life expectancy in the country is one year less than in cities yeah. because of access to healthcare is poorer. So, so a, a very good example of, of, of localising that in terms of effects and, and how you get the most impact. If you go to somewhere like um, India, by far the most effective way of improving public health is to stop cooking on indoor smoking stoves. Uh, now, once you've solved that problem, it will be something else that will deal with that. And it is important, that, and that there's, a, there's a lot of... Um, acknowledgement about not exporting, if you like, European and American solutions to other places, if only because those hot spots on the map, in terms of the chemistry, we're all living in mid-latitudes, 50 degrees north or whatever. A lot of these hot spots are not at those mid-high latitudes. They're actually towards the equator. And all the chemistry is different. So you absolutely have to localise the solution, not only where you are in the economic cycle, but you've got to localise it in terms of the chemistry as well, because it'll be different in Mexico City uh, than it is in London.
So there's a very patient guy at the back, right there. Well, a comment, really, rather than a question. Um, okay. A comment, really, rather than a question. Um, one of the biggest problems of environmental pollution in whatever form, whether it's air, water or soil, is in terms of visibility and public perception. Now, pollution from the 50s and 60s, of course, was highly visible. Uh, those of us old enough to have experienced it knew that you couldn't actually see a hand in front of your face for several days at a time on one's way to school. Um, those were pretty bad days. Um, but these days, what we don't realise is pollution is actually far worse now but you just can't see it. If we could see the gases in the air today around us, we would be horrified and we would be taking vigorous actions. But because it appears clear, nobody can see the pollution, we don't appear to think that there's a problem. So there's a perceptual problem here which is difficult to get across, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd slightly take it, it, air quality is better now than in the 1950s. It's different. In absolute terms, weighing chemicals up, there is less in the air than there was, but the impacts of that are higher for the reasons that, that I went through. Uh, you're right that if you can't see it, you sometimes then don't think it's important, but I think there are, there are other ways to visualise the impacts here, and I think the point at which the sophistication at which, for example, hospital admissions and so on track um, air pollution... That's visualising it in a different way. Yes, you might not be able to see it, but when newspapers start plotting the strong correlations between ambulance call-outs and so on, that's a different way of seeing the problem. You might not be able to see it directly, but I think when that sort of information is readily accessible in the public domain, you've got the visibility, but in a different way. Shall we take one final question? Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I wondered about um, the coverage you're able to get in these emissions um, uh, with, your, with your flying the plane across London. I wondered, uh, at the beginning it was mentioned about miniaturising devices, and I wonder whether you have any plans, or whether there are any plans to have sort of public, crowdsourced, distributed measurements of uh, these kinds of things. Would putting uh, these measurements in the hands of the public um, be of any benefit? Right. It would. Right. This is a quite a sort of tricky area. Um, there is a lot going on in terms of cheap sensors for air pollution, trying to, if you like, move these things out into the public domain. However, the number has got to be right. Okay. It's a number that's legislated in law. Okay. It's it's something that councils have to meet. There are regulatory standards and so on. So I sort of draw the analogy with if you're a keen meteorologist and you want to have a weather station. To you, as a sort of key meteorologist, it probably doesn't matter if the weather station temperature measurement is wrong by one or two degrees. Yeah. But it would be useless to you if it was wrong by 20 degrees. Yeah, it said zero and it was 20 degrees outside. Where we are at the moment with miniaturised sensors is that they are, if you like, a guide to pollution going up and down, but they are wrong typically by hundreds of percent. And I would say until they get to the point, if you like, that they would that a weather station would be acceptable to the sort of amateur keen meteorologist. We don't want these um, too widely distributed because they provide misleading information. And of course, if these are going to feed into healthcare decisions, if you're an asthmatic and you're going to look at your monitor that you've bought from Amazon for £100 and it says nitrogen dioxide and particulars is going to be this and you use your inhaler, you know, you're, you're using that information for significantly more than it was probably designed for. So I think that there should be lots of effort put into getting these lower cost or more autonomous systems right, but I think be very careful with the data until it's at the right sort of accuracy that it's actually going to be useful to people. And at that point, it will completely change everything because there'll be one on every lamppost and people will be demanding, you know, demanding action. But I think we are a long way away from it. There's, there's a reason these things are done in shipping containers and cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. If there was a shortcut to having it done for 100 quid, you know, it sounds too good to be true, and at the moment it sort of probably is. Probably is. Probably yeah. is, yeah. That's a, an accuracy versus precision debate, isn't <laughs> yes. it? But, um, okay, I think in, in the interest of time, I'm going to draw a, a, a conclusion to, uh, to this evening um, and let Ali take some water on board. <laughs> um, I, I, I was really struck by, I, I know this guy as an atmospheric chemist, and I know how much atmospheric chemistry he knows, but what, what was struck... Uh, what struck me was, was how much you understood the implications and how much you developed the implications of those. Um, and, and they were fascinating and, uh, and very plausible. I, I should just 
like to conclude the evening. I think we have tea and coffee outdoors, okay? Um, but I should like you to um, join me in thanking Ali for a wonderful. <laughs>